Hey, yo, you are now locked in with the Bookum Show. Building bridges, baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are here. We are here. Episode number nine. I am Bookum, the host of the Bookum Show and also founder of the Bridges Project, Inc., which is a nonprofit based out of New Jersey. And listen, people, I have a very, very special guest. I know I say that, but this brother right here to my right, who you see on camera, is phenomenal. If you're listening on Spotify, you will soon find out who I'm talking about. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce Mr. J. Bromley, episode number nine. Give it up for Jay Bromley, baby. What's up, man? Hey, what up, Booker, man? Thank you for having me. Man, it's a pleasure to have you, brother. Uh, Real quick, man, I want to introduce you. Uh, I met Jay one day I was patrolling his sea caucus. Uh, This was like five years ago, bro. Isn't it crazy how time flies? Like a bird. It's crazy, bro. So I'm I'm patrolling and I see this big, strong black brother coming out of Red Lobster. (laughs) Super, super humble dude, man. Um, didn't know who he was in the beginning. I approached him very, very approachable, humble, and he introduced himself as Jay Bromley, for, Jay Bromley from the New York Giants defensive tackle number 96. Um, and just a pleasant, pleasant dude. That's the way I met him. We became friends. We built a relationship. Such a great, humble dude. So tell the people a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and a little bit about what you're doing now. Well, first and foremost, thank you for having me. That's a, uh, it's a great opportunity to meet you. I'm sure that when you first walked up to me, I was probably sweating a little bit. <laughs> uh, coming from Jamaica, Queens. When a, you know, coming from Jamaica, Queens, you just said it. You was in full uniform and everything. That's not, <laughs> it's not, a, that's not a promising visit. That's, that's not true. something I'm looking forward to. I'm like, yeah. as soon as I see, <laughs> you know, you come from the inner city, you don't see cops for help. You see cops, you think you did something wrong. You're like, hey, man, wow. I, I done broke a tail light. What I done did now? I done... <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Got somebody, somebody, I fit a description. What happened, man? The big black guy? I'm like, hey. <laughs> oh, yeah, I fit all those. But, um, but yeah, man, I'm from Jamaica, Queens, born and raised. I was fortunate enough to go to Syracuse University. I was fortunate enough to, you know, make it all the way to the New York Giants and, and, and play football professionally for my hometown team. That's a lot about me, man. I was, I'm just a humble kid from Jamaica, Queens, man, that wow. was fortunate to survive, you know, coming from, you know, uh, an environment that a lot of people don't survive or a lot of people don't make it out fully from. And um, I'm grateful to be sitting here with you. You're not doing the story justice. We're going to get into it. <laughs> we're going to dig deep and we're going to go into the trenches because that's where you played your career, football, in the trenches, right? Um, you went to, well, first let's start at the beginning of Jay Bromley. Born, right, in Jamaica, Queens, South Side, Jamaica, Queens. South Side. One of the roughest areas in New York, correct? Yeah, is yeah. this where 50 Cent is from? That's like literally like a two or three blocks away. Wow. Like, so imagine like, it's funny that you say that because growing up when uh, 50 Cent came out, it was in like the late 90s or early 2000s. Like when he came, we felt like he put Southside on the map. Like wow. he was proud to be from Southside because 50 Cent really, you know, really made it feel like it was worth something. Because you he, knew. And, yeah. And you felt, do, do you feel like. I've never been to Southside Jamaica, Queens, but do you feel like he represented the culture of that community? Oh, most certainly. The like environment the of, of Sufton and Archer, when you went out there and how, you know, I call it, I call it like a spidey sense, right? Like when you, when you come from that environment, when you go back to that environment, you develop like a spidey sense for danger, mm. you know? So you, you're going, you know, you obviously you got homeless people around and different things of that nature, but then, you know, the group that's on the block, that's on the corner, the guys that you know that's just doing things illegally, right? That you got a rapport relationship with. So you develop a spidey sense of how to really acknowledge danger and how to maneuver around it, right? So yeah. that that's like that he he embodied that. Like the, the the side of the person that was going to get it and take it from you and the side of the person that was going to get it taken. And I never thought of it in that sense, the way you put it. That's the spidey sense and that's that's like in, in Christian terms, we call that discernment. You know what I mean? Like discernment, having discernment. Um, so you were born Southside Jamaica, Queens. Um, I get goosebumps talking about this. And when I when I looked up your story, I did thorough research on you because me and you never had like a deep conversation. And I said, bro, I got to find out more about my guy, Jay. And your story is phenomenal. So you were born 
to a mother who was a crack addict, right? Um, unfortunately, um, your father, you know, was said to be a pimp. Is this all true? All true. Okay. And you, I read that you were born yourself is considered as considered being a crack addict baby crack, as well. Yeah, what they call a crack baby or something. Is like that, that true? <laughs> what does that mean? Um, I don't know. I guess it means like when a person that your mother was on drugs, uh, crack at the time, and you're born supposedly with that in your system, right? So then they would call those a crack baby. Wow. So um, it's ironic though, right? Because now that I'm older, <laughs> and, my, and my biological father, right, he would joke about this. He would, he would say, he's like, you want no crack baby. And I'm like, he was like, you would be the biggest crack baby I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. You know, because he, he was, it was just made it funny. But then like, as I get older, like watching certain documentaries around like just those terminologies. Yeah. That was a terminology that was thrown around a lot because of the environment. Ah, I get right? you. And, and it actually scientifically isn't, isn't a big percentage. Like, and even if your mother was on drugs like that, like yeah. the percentage of kids that actually were born within the system is like very small. Oh, gotcha. But, but it was something that, but look, that. but honestly, my mother, my, so I was raising my aunt, my uncle. Yeah. So Francis and Roy Nimmons. <laughs> Francis and Roy Nimmons. Yes. So my, okay. my, my auntie told me I was a crack baby. So that's what, <laughs> that's where the story come from. You know? <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh, wow. But I, I'm, I'm assuming she said it like, you know, jokingly. And- uh, no, she meant it. No, oh, wow. she, she meant it. She meant it like, no, no, your mother was a crack. Your mother's all crack. So is this so your mother's sister? No, this is my father's sister. Your father's sister. Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so this is your father's, your father's sister and her husband that raised you. Yes. My father's sister and her husband raised me. Francis and Roy Nimmons. Yes. Gotcha. And this is in, this is all in, in, in Jamaica, Queens. Yep. South side Jamaica, Queens. Four months old. You were technically abandoned, right? Um, tell us a little bit about that. You were abandoned. Obviously, you don't remember, you know, this, the, you know, leading up to what happened. Um, your father was arrested. Tell us a little bit about that story between your mother and your father and what happened and how you ended up in the hands of your aunt and uncle. So what I know from the story is my mother was visiting a friend in Queens at the time. And she left me with the friend to go do drugs. And she told the friend, hey, I'll be back in like an hour or so. So she leaves and she doesn't come back for hours. So the friend figures out how to get in contact with my biological father. And my biological father comes and gets me. And he doesn't see my mother, biological mother, as fit to take care of me. So he brings me to my auntie, which is his sister. Mm. And he says, can you take care of my son? And literally, like, I was probably, like, three or four months, maybe five months old at the time, and she agrees. And uh, my uncle, which is Roy, they agreed to take me in. And mind you, my father goes to prison for 17 years, probably three or four months after that transaction. Wow. What did he go to prison for? He went to prison for murder. Mm. Do you do you feel comfortable about talking about the reason why he went he went to prison for murder? What were the circumstances behind that? Uh, it was it was some circumstances where, like I said, like you, we talked about, he was in the streets heavy. Gotcha. Uh, whether gotcha. it be selling drugs and, and pimping. Pimping was big back in those days, right? Okay. So I've, I've grew up around prostitution my whole life in that sense. Like my mother was one of his prostitutes. Wow. So, so wow. they had a lot of women like that around. So he went to prison for killing one of my, si- my sister's mother. And... And then he went and did So wait a years. minute. I'm sorry to cut you off. So you have a sister. So let me just clarify this. You have a sister who was a half sister because she was from another woman yes. that was working for your dad. Same father. Wow. Same father, different mother. Different mother, yep. Wow. Um, it's insane, bro. It's insane um, what you overcame. Fast forward. Fast forward. Um your father goes to prison, right? Essentially, you don't really have a relationship with him. You you now have Roy as the male figure. You mentioned your grandmother to me, right? Yeah. Where does your grandmother come into this picture? So my grandmother is the mother of my biological father and my and my aunt that brings me okay, in. So gotcha. she's the she's she's the matriarch of the family in that way. Mm. 
And she pretty much at first, my mother used to tell a story like at first, my grandmother didn't want nothing to do with me, <laughs> you know, and she didn't, she didn't, I was, I used to cry a lot. Right. So yeah. when I was a baby, I used to cry a lot. And I also had a hernia. Oh, so man. I had a hernia when I was younger. So I used to cry a lot. So I used to be aggravated. I can imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it, it wasn't until I got to a certain age, probably like five or six or something like that, when my grandmother really grabbed hold of me. Mm. And she really started to, because I was the only, so my mother, so my, Francis and Roy adopted me and they adopted my older sister. To share. And this is a legal adoption legal through adoption, the court system. Through the gotcha, court system. Gotcha. The only difference is my last name never changed. So I kept my biological mother's last name, but my mm. my older sister, she she her last name was changed, and then it's like my uh, like my aunt and my uncle. I got you. So she they adopted both of us, and I, so and but they already had two girls that they had between each other. So I'm the only boy. So that's the picture that I saw of you with three females behind you. You were the baby. Yes, I'm the baby boy. What I find so ironic is that your father, you know, your father. Your father's side of the family took care of you, which your father was involved in criminal activity, which which tells me, which speaks volumes. You know why? Because I work in law enforcement, obviously, you know that. And I always tell people, you know, um, it isn't always generational, right? Sometimes people make bad decisions. Doesn't mean that their whole, you know, the, the whole family dynamic is bad, Right. You could be have individuals within the family that turn out to make bad decisions. But it's just ironic to me that his side of the family took care of you. A lot of times it's the mother's side of the family. Am I right to assume that? I think probably normally yeah, uh, it right? seems like that that nurturing side kind of might because yes. might, yeah. you would think that because I think more more times than not, the child falls into the mother's arms and that side of the family more often. Not that the yes. dad takes the kid and tries to figure out what's best for him. Mm, yes. And and I thank God for that. You know, I thank God for my dad for that. I think that I, I thank my pops for having the wherewithal to say, let me go get my son and let me put my son in somebody's hands that I trust. Wow. Yeah, that takes because like, yeah. he could have left me. That's honorable. And yeah. and he could have never picked up the phone. He could have been so knee deep in the streets and not cared about his son. So if there was one thing that my father ever did right for me, it was that. Do you have a good relationship with him now? We're we're good, man. He lives in Brooklyn. He drives buses. Um, he served his time. He served mm. seventeen years in the penitentiary, and um, he came home. He was a barber in prison. I remember he gave me when he first came home from prison. He was um cutting hair, and then uh, I got a haircut or two from him. I, I I'll never do it again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's not that he was a bad barber. He just he just you know how they talk about prison ball. Like how they play ball in prison, yeah, like it's oh, different. Oh, he's rough. He's rough on the oh, head. Oh no, no, he's rough, man. <laughs> Turning to, your head real right, quick. Right, right. Turning me all crazy. And I had to had to talk to him. Like, hey, man, you are not in prison anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a free yeah, man, yeah, man. Yeah. Let me go. Like, yeah. top you know, <laughs> clip is real Chippy, sharp. Chipping like, you up. Yeah, you got like the red outline. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like these I've ain't shank clippers no more, man. Let me go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he might have done some bad things, and he did his time. But people can change. And you and I are both Christian. We believe in God and we believe in redemption. And we believe, right? We believe in all that. What was the household like being that you were the only male? You were surrounded by females. Was there was there a Christian foundation in that home? Not really, man. It was more so um, growing up, like you said, I was the only boy. And the reason my grandmother grabbed so hold of me and, and God rest her soul, because my, my biological father, ironically, only boy. Wow. So he was the only boy. He was the oldest. I was the only boy. I was the youngest. And if you hear the stories about if I when I got the stories about my dad from how he was growing up, he was the he was the golden child because he was the only boy. And that's just kind of my my grandmother was. So when I became I started to become that, too. But she mm -hmm. had some great foundations like she 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 put in me like work ethic, like taking out the garbage, cleaning up chores. Right. Like she used to have me do all those things and they were, they were building something in me, like having some respect for my surroundings as far as wanting things to be clean. But the house, right. but the house structure, it was, it, it was, it was interesting because it wasn't like, oh, I get saved from being in the hood and I go to, you know, this, it, this wasn't the Fresh Prince. You know what I'm saying? Mm, I didn't get saved yeah. from, oh, I was in the hood. I was in South Philadelphia or South Side Jamaica. And then I go to Beverly Hills with my aunt and my uncle. That wasn't it. It was like I went from, okay, you might have went straight to the system. You get saved and you get put in the arms of your, aunt and your uncle who doing the best they can, but you're still in Southside Jamaica, Queens. 
You're still, you're still in this, there. You're still, still in this there. environment where in the 90s, it's like, man, uh, my neighborhood was all blood, crip, and MOB. So you're growing up and, and, it's, and it's just this melting pot mm. with, with young men that ain't doing nothing. You know what I'm saying? How did you stay away from that? I don't know. Because I saw, I saw you had cousins that were involved, mm-hmm. knee deep in the streets. Um, and, and being around that, how did you not get enticed by that lifestyle? I really, I really book them. I think it's God's hand. I think God's providence, mm-hmm. man, on my life to some extent. It has to be. Mm-hmm. Because, like I said, my older brother, I have an older brother, half brother as well, who was a pimp. So I used to see prostitution my whole life. And, and, and all the things that you want to see from whether it be the drug dealers when it came to the cars, the money, the clothes, I seen all that with my brother. And all that, the only thing I knew he did was pimp. Wow. You know, and I seen it. Like, I'm talking like, I seen the Range Rover in front of the house in Jamaica. I seen the the Maybach in front of the house in Jamaica. I seen I went to my junior high school prom in a S550 all white. And one summer, him picking me up in like a red candy paint double S old school and driving in the car listening to Jay-Z's Kingdom album or something like that. And he come to the car, he, he threw like maybe like twenty thousand dollars cash in like a Ziploc bag in my lap and we riding around. So I remember wow. that. So like and, and like I said, but I also remember my house, like in Jamaica, Queens, almost being like a a place where he used to bring all the girls. So my aunt would almost be like a mother to him, like, like a house mom. You know, me being a father of all girls, I'll be, I'll be real with you, brother. That bothers me. You know what I mean? And I can, because I know you, I know your heart. I, I've spoken to you. Did that bother you at the time to see that? And especially you having sisters that were around your cousins, older cousins, and your grandmother. You know, how did that make you feel, seeing these women like that? The truth is, like now, I can look back at it and be like, all right, that was wrong, and I, I feel a way about it because of my belief system. Mm-hmm. But when you grow up in that environment, like like I said, my mom, she was from the streets. You know what I'm saying? So, so I mean, when I say my mom, I'm talking about my aunt. She was from the streets. So we were raised in that environment. We were we mm. knew what was going on. Like my mom didn't really hide that stuff like that. We knew the game. You know what I'm saying? So even my sisters, like, it wasn't no, they they was around them too. Like it wasn't it was unacceptable for them to become that. But they understood that. You're desensitized to it. You it's like it is what it is. This is what I'm surrounded with. This is what this part of the life that I'm in. Right. So I could understand what you're saying by that. Absolutely. So now you, how did you, how did you, you ended up going to Flushing High School in in Queens. Did you start playing football right away your freshman year? Or tell us about your high school, the inception of getting involved in football. Yeah, so football, as far as a a sport where I actually played with on a team and, and all the configuration and all that, that didn't happen until I got to high school. So uh, I went to high school. I never really played organized sports before. I played in the wow. streets. I played killer man with the ball. I played all them street games. On the concrete, tackling yeah. on the concrete. I played all that stuff. <laughs> so I go to high school and I go to Flushing. Only reason I went to Flushing, that wasn't even my zone school. In New York, you have zone school. So literally, like, if you're not specifically trying to go to a specific school, you go to a school that's within your zone. Yeah. And Hillcrest was in within my zone, but my sisters all went to Flushing, I don't even know why. I don't even know if it was a better school. I knew my aunt lived around the corner, so we (laughs) used her address so that we can get that as a zone school. Might be better. (laughs) I don't know, but (laughs) yeah, I went. I go to Flushing and like from like my freshman year, I just said, "Hey, man, you know what? I'm gonna try football." How big were you at this point? I was only probably like maybe six feet. But you were chunky. But you were chunky. Chunky, yeah. yeah. So you were like chunky, but I'm assuming strong. Chunky. I don't even know if I was strong. I know I was chunky. I know I was chunky. I was eating good. I was yeah. eating all the Tyson chicken out of my sister's freezer. And, and I was eating all the beef patties. And I, that's oh, what I was beef doing. Beef patties, man. Yo, I love the beef patties. I ain't going to lie, man. So now you were a freshman. You say, yo, I'm going to try out for football. How did it go for you? Oh, it went horrible. It went absolutely horrible. So, so let me paint the picture. So my, like we talked about my grandmother, right? So my grandmother, probably at like four or five years old, whatever it is, becomes the like the staple in my life. Not even my mom, my aunt, my uncle, not them. Like they, they were there. They're all there. Like we went from living in Queens and South Side Jamaica, Queens. We went lived in the projects in East New York for a couple of years, like literally like two bedroom, one bedroom apartment, seven, eight people. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Me and all my sisters and my grandmother all sleeping in one room. 
So so we did that. So my grandmother became like, you know, she she really, you know, cultivated me in a lot of different ways until that when I right before I went to high school, she dies. Wow, sorry to hear that, man. So so she passes away at, at, at Jamaica Hospital. And then so I go, I'm going into high school and I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. All right, cool. I'm going to high school. I decided to play for, I decided to try out. Or oh, no, I, I decided to get on the team. At the time, that was the t- had Flushing High School. Shout out Jimmy DeSantis, who brought Flushing back to any type of respect level football wise. That was the first year they came back. And I, I try, I go on the football team. It's during the summertime, it's like hot. And we run in 300s. 300s is when you ride to run around the whole field wow. with your pads on. Wow. In the heat. And I'm just like, yo. This is, and I'm a little fat kid. I ain't, I ain't, I don't even have a position yet. I'm just over there running with pads on. Yeah. And I remember going home and I was like, and I told, this is, I went home and I cried and I told my mother, I don't know what I was going on in my head, but it was like, I was like, I miss my grandma to my uh, mom yeah, yeah, and I wanted to quit. Yeah. And my mom said probably the most, one of the most important things, if not the most important thing she ever said to me in my life was she said, if you want to quit, Quit because you want to quit. Mm. Don't let nothing make you quit. Mm. So I went home. I cried. <clears throat> I cried in my bed. I got up and I never looked back. When your grandmother passed away, how did that make you feel at that moment? You know, you know, the crazy thing about that is my grandmother always wanted me with her. And as a young kid, you always want to be where everybody else is. Right. Mm. So. So I remember it like it was yesterday. So my 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 cousins and, and they they go to um they went to like Jones Beach or something like that. Some some nearby beach. And I I'm like 12, 13, whatever it is, and I want to go. And we all going. Except my grandmother and my dad are staying home. And she's like, Jay, don't go. I'm like, just stay home. Stay home. And I'm like, right, grandma, I wanna go. Like everybody else is going. I yeah, wanna yeah, go. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. I go. And literally, by the time we get back home, she's in the hospital. Wow. And then the next day she passes away. Wow. Did you feel guilty? I, I would say I probably, I did. Yeah, definitely, but you, you were felt, so young. I was so young, yeah, but I, I didn't so know young. that's probably, that's probably yeah. why it was it spurred up when, I've never been a super emotional kid. Yeah. Like I'm not emotional like that. Like my emotions probably came, I fought a lot when I was young. When I was in high school, I was really like, I fought a lot. So when I had fights, the most emotion I showed, I would get so upset. I'd cry. If I was crying, I was blacking out and I was tearing something up. Mm. Like that was that was what I did in, high, in 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 elementary school. Like that was what I was known for. Like I'm a blackout and I'm gonna beat somebody up. Eesh. So that that was that was how I just channeled all my frustration and anger and emotion. I wasn't like I feel something. It yeah, was no way. Yeah. I never understood how to express that. I'm gonna really quick jump into the Demar Hamlin situation, right? And then we're gonna get back to your story. Um, with the Demar Hamlin, I'm so blessed that he's doing better. Right, mm-hmm. but what bothered me is people jumping on the bandwagon of oh, pray for Hamlin, pray for Hamlin, pray. They ain't praying. Exactly. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? But like, but like, it bothers me because there's people out here dying every day for 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 no disrespect to Demar. And may may God forever bless him and his family. But like, something happened. He survived. You know, like there's a lot of worse things happening out here, and I just feel like people jump on emotional bandwagons. Oh. We're emotional creatures. Yeah. So I can't even blame people for jumping on emotional bandwagons because emotion means energy in motion. At the time mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. of whatever something happens, that's where the energy's going. That's true. You know true. what I'm saying? So, yeah. so I'm not even mad at that because I know that moments change people. I, I say that all the time. Life is about moments. So when you know that, you, you never disrespect the moment because the moment could be everlasting and, and impactful to how this person views life. Like that DeMar Hamlin, hopefully that impacted every football player that saw it and realized that, hey, man, we, um, we take this thing for granted. Like we get up and we do this every mm. single day and we think nothing of it because we're, 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 we thought, we think we're glad, gladiators. We think that nothing can harm us. We literally make deals in our own hearts about, hey, man, I remember I did it at Syracuse. I was like, I come from the hood. I'm going back home with roaches on the walls. I ain't got no bed. Hey, man, if I'm going to die, let me go ahead and die out here. Wow. You know what I'm saying? That, I don't that want... was really your mentality? I was, well, I, remember, wow. I, was, I, was, I was walking in the dome, and I looked around, and I said, if I'm going to die, I'm going to do it here. Wow. Like, why well, I'm going to go back home and die for it. Everybody die there. People don't die here. That's crazy. You know what I'm saying? Wow, like, if nothing else, it's going to be something different than what I know, you know? So- 
when you heard about, I know we jumped off topic, but we're going to get right back. But I want this last question about DeMar Hamlin. What was your first thought about when you saw the ambulance drive onto the turf and come um, give aid to DeMar Hamlin? This is serious. And when you start to see the emotion of the players turn out the way it did, you start to understand how serious it is. And the, and the way I explain this to people is when you're a football player, especially when you're fortunate enough to go from high school to college to the NFL, you realize that you've been preconditioned to move on. Meaning, literally, if somebody gets hurt in practice, I don't care if they tear their ACL, they tear their knee, whatever it is. If they get hurt on the five, we move to the 15. We keep going. You replace him. He's replaceable. We keep going. Wow. This train don't stop for him. I don't care if it's Eli Manning or Tom Brady. This train don't stop for him. You know what I'm saying? This train going to keep going. And that's what normally happens. So you're preconditioned for that. So when you see the emotion of if somebody has to get resuscitated on the field, resuscitation means you died. That's true. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So so the reality of it is you watch somebody die on the football field. That's a traumatic event because I've performed yeah. CPR on people. Mm -hmm. So I know what it's like. You watch somebody die potentially twice, right? Right in front of your eyes and you love this person. Why? You spend an enormous amount of time with this individual. You got to know them. Maybe you get to know their families, right? You love them. That's your brother. You were committed to this. You had a goal at the beginning of the season. You bonded around this goal and you went out to do this together. So- I'm not surprised at the emotion of the players. Mm. It made me want to cry like that because I know what it is. I know what the locker room's like. I know I know the work that we put in. I know that how much time we put into rehab. Like every player you see is in rehab every day, mm. you know, in some way, shape, form, or fashion. You don't get to week 17, 18 without being in rehab mm. and on your body. Some way, somehow. That's just the nature of the game. There's no, nobody's escaping this thing clean. By week two, everybody's feeling it. Mm. So when you know that You're like The respect level for the guy that, that laces it up I don't care if he's not your starter Or he's not your Best fantasy player He Look man Even if the last guy on that bench Is better Is better than 99.9% .9 Of everybody else That play the game That's That is a fact I forgot what the number is But it's like <clears throat> Correct me if I'm wrong You probably know better but like 3% of the football population ever makes it to the NFL or something? It's crazy. It's like a crazy number. Oh, uh, right? you multiply it times three. It's 1%. It's 1%, right? It's 1%. That's, so that's how yeah. blessed you are. So you you join the football team. Your mother told you you're going to quit only if you decide to quit. And you say, I'm going to go forward and you never look back. Right? You yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I wake up. I get up for my, my you know, my, you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. My crying or whatever. <laughs> and I decide that. Because I wanted to quit because of the emotional aspect of it. But, hey, man, look, I was a little fat, chubby kid, man. I was tired. The physical. I, yeah. It was like, man, Coach D, whatever y'all doing out here, y'all tripping. Y'all got yeah. me in these 15, 20 pounds of gear, running around this field, 300. It's like, man, I ain't never did this before. I don't know. I don't have a position yet. Like, I don't know why I'm here. <laughs> like, but Coach D saw me in the hallway. He was like, hey, man, you playing football. Yeah. You playing football. Big guy like you. I need big guys like you. You playing football. <laughs> so hey, what? thank you, Coach D. Shout to Coach G. Uh, D, Jimmy DeSantis, right? Jimmy D. Yeah, yeah Jimmy D. So um, you started playing. What position did you play right away? The first position I played in football was center. Center, wow. How did you like that? Uh, I didn't, like I said, I never played organized football. So the position thing was just me learning different skills, right? Yeah. So learning how to snap the ball, you know, shotgun a different way. Learning all the, you know, learning the offensive configuration, learning how to be, you know, put myself in an advantageous position. So it was fun. I'm like, once I learned it and like, I started to become a better athlete, like it was starting to be fun. Gotcha. So then you, now, for, now let's fast forward. Your third all borough, mm -hmm. right? A third team all borough. And for some weird reason, you're not highly recruited by colleges out there. Mm -hmm. Right? How did that make you feel, man? Well, I'm a different mentality kind of guy. Like, like I said, we the emotion, the emotions thing. Like, I'm relatively like cool, calm, and elective, and I want to make people laugh. Like, I I never aspired really early on to be a football player. Like, I watched Eddie Murphy. I wanted to be a comedian. Like, that was my goal. Like, I love to like see people enjoy, laugh, That's and dope. and that was what That's I dope. wanted to be. Yeah. So, football was kind of like something I fell into, and I just stayed with it, and I grew and I developed. But like when it got to that point when I was in my senior year, so I was all borough. So once I didn't really play my freshman year. So my second year, I become a full-time starting center. 
I do okay. My third year, I'm a full-time starting center, play a little bit of defense, really none. I'm an all-borough center. And then my senior year, I go from being a center to the left tackle, and I go starting a left tackle and starting a defensive end. So mm-hmm. never coming off the field. So I go into that. Look, I had, shout out Coach Rudy, man. RP Coach Rudy. Rudy was my uh, defensive line coach who really took me under his wing and really taught me everything in high school about football. He always tell me, Larry Johnson, the defensive line coach for um, Ohio State, he's the best defensive line coach. You could not talk bad about Larry in front of Rudy. And ironically, I'll, I'll get to the point of the story, I almost went to, he was at Penn State at the time. I almost went to Penn State because of Larry. Mm-hmm. And... um. So I work my butt off and and you get to the point where I got 10 plus sacks. You know, I'm one of the best. I'm, I feel like I'm the best. The only player I feel like is better than me is Dominic Easley. And he was in Dominic Easley, went to Florida. He's a high title recruit, was like a four or five star out of um, coming out of New York, out of Staten Island. And I always, you know, measure myself up to him. So when it came to me not having a lot of exposure, it was more about I knew that I belonged. I just didn't have the look because it's not just about being a good football player. I come from poverty. I don't have the money to go to Nike camp. Mm. I don't have the money to go to Under Armour camp. Like the camps that I did go to, thank God for my coaches that could drive me and took me to them. Because if it was up to my parents, I would have went nowhere. So even like the little Fordham camp I did, the Rutgers camp I did, that was because of my coaches. That wasn't because I I had the money to do it. Wow. So that that played a big part in my under recruitment because, you know, you learn over time that you can't teach size. So if a guy is six foot four, three hundred pounds, it's like they'll like eventually they'll start giving people scholarships because they're like, yeah, I can't walk around and find him. That's true. I just yeah. gotta see if I can make him something. Yeah. yeah and yeah. and ironically, by the time it did come around, like Syracuse come, but Syracuse didn't want me. They, they passed on you. Mm-hmm. So Syracuse passes on you. Then there's an annual uh, outback stake. Um, Empire mm-hmm. Ball. Empire Challenge, yeah. Empire Challenge in New York is a yearly thing, right? Yes. Yearly the, thing. Boomer, boomer. It's size. Long Island versus New York. Yes. Long Island versus New York. And you go in, you go in there. This is like a Rudy moment, bro. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like in, in a weird way. Obviously different, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but what I'm saying is that you go in there as an underdog, basically. Like mm-hmm. you only had one scholarship offer to Stony Brook University. Right. So they 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 wanted you. But you go in there. What was your mentality going in there? Because I'm going to tell the people the outcome. Mm -hmm. But what was your mentality? What like how did you wake up that morning knowing you was going to go play in this game? Ironically, like this is the funny part before how I got to that game was really cruel to me, because what happened was this is pretty much the same time I realized Syracuse didn't want me the first time they had to look at me. So Doug Marone was the coach at the time at Syracuse and um, Coach Ansamo was a coach too at Syracuse. And they looked at my tape and then my coach Rudy told me they thought my feet were too slow to play Mm -hmm. at their level, to play at the Division I level. So Coach Rudy tells me that. He's like, remember that. All right, cool. So like you said, Stony Brook offers me early. Then they pull my offer late because one thing people don't know about is clearinghouse. Uh, if any athletes out there, especially high school athletes, understand what clearinghouse is. Clearinghouse is basically the process that if you want to play Division One sports, you got to clear the house. That means you have to have a certain GPA. You have to have a certain uh, ACT score, SAT score. And, they ha- and there, it's a benchmarks, basically, where you have to meet if you want to go Division One and play. So it's not like, oh, I can just graduate with a C and I can go play D1. I got to actually meet a criteria to go play D1. So if you don't know that and you got to be with your guidance counselor early enough on to understand, I got to be on track to do this. So if you don't even know you want to play, you can graduate and not be eligible. So wait a minute. Let me get this right. LeBron James, Mm -hmm. I'm just using him because he was a freak of nature Mm -hmm. coming out of high school. You mean to tell me that if LeBron James didn't meet certain criteria, he wouldn't have got a scholarship to college? He could have got all the scholarship he wanted. He wouldn't have been able to go play. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know that. You have you have to you have to meet the requirements. So long story short, once I get a little bit of something that my coach feel like I can play at the next level, I start to meet my guidance counselor, start to get that stuff in order. Literally, I had to take during that summer, I had to take two math classes. Like the reason Stony Brook pulled my scholarship that they were trying to they offer me was because they didn't feel like I would clear. Cause they're like, all right, you need two extra math classes that you gotta take after you, like two months before you graduate. 
So it's like, how do you how are you gonna get that done and come in when you when you're supposed to come in? So they pulled it because they didn't think I was gonna clear clearinghouse. So oh, that was you know their loss. Uh, so they slept on you. <laughs> yeah, they slept on you. But oh, I'm sorry. Oh, let me get back to the uh, uh, the uh, the story about um the Empire Challenge. So basically, yeah. Yeah. so we basically we're sitting in a room. So I've been all borough before. There's a dinner, all borough and all city players, right? So all borough, you get this little you know, miniature trophy or whatever. So I, wait, cool. hold on. I'm my bad. All borough is the five boroughs together. The five boroughs together. That's right. that's that's tough. Yes. And then and then all city is obviously just Queens. All city, yeah. All city you. is okay. above it. So now like no all, all city is above no, it. All city is New York City. New York so City. So all borough me. Okay, you one of the best players in your borough. Oh, so I got now you. all okay. city me. You one of the best players in the city. In the city. Period. Ah, I got you. New York City. New York City. All, all together. New York city. I got you. I got you. So ah. boom, I'm 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 all borough the year before that. Cool. So now when you, I know how it goes. So when you go there, you sit in the auditorium. All borough get their trophies. Cool. You get your little trophy. Now all city, they like play a highlight of the person, and then they call them up. Right, and they give them their trophy. They stand on stage. So, mind you, after my senior years open, I over. I had over ten sacks. I felt like I killed. I deserved it in my heart, and my coaches felt like I deserved it. Right. So I'm sitting there with my boys from from high school, and we all looking at these people getting called up for all city. And I'm sitting there like, man, I'm better than him. 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 I'm better than him twice on Thursdays. So I'm that dude. Yeah. So so we sitting there, and then all of a sudden, my highlight comes on. So I see my highlight come on and then I look to my right. Coach D, he has an envelope in his hand. Surprised you. Surprised me. Wow. And he says, he says, congratulations. Wow. And but because of the type of person I am, I'm grateful. But as soon as I get on that stage, like you said, the mentality thing, I get on that stage. I look at everybody on that stage. I say, I'm going to be the best player on this stage. Good for that you, night, man. I'm like, I'm going to be the best player on this stage, bar Good none. Good for you. Good for you, man. So Good that's that's how that was where the mentality was. It was like, yo, like, okay, you're gonna that's keep dope. sleeping, you're I gonna like you're that. gonna wake up. I like that. I got a good friend of mine. He said, There's nothing humble about lying. That's true. There's nothing that's humble crazy. about lying. So I'm like, he man, wasn't lying. I ain't lying. Right? What do these kids say nowadays? Facts. <laughs> Facts, right? Facts. <laughs> so yo, you you get the uh, you get the all borough well deserved right ten sack season, um, you uh, you kill you body the Empire Challenge game. You are the MVP of the M- Empire Challenge game. Oh yeah, yeah. Most valuable player of the Empire Challenge game, which is wild to me because I'm gonna tell you why it's wild to me. Rarely do you hear about a defensive lineman. Getting yeah. an MVP. Yeah. So tell me, game. tell me, my dude, how that went down. Like, tell me about <laughs> it. Because you know, it's like an offensive type thing, yeah. right? Yeah. So tell me, man, what made you stand out that day? Man, it was a, it was a great opportunity. I, I went out there, like, like I said, with the mentality, if I'm going to be the best player on this field, I felt like I showed it in practice. I, I was a starter. I started at defensive end. And I knew what I could do. And I, and I kept that chip on my shoulder. I didn't feel like I, and even with my high school, like Flesher High School, I felt like I was representing more than just myself. Mm. So when I went to that game, it was just all of that with me. And I was like, yo, I'm going to show you. Like, it's, it's not even, it's, oh, I'm playing, I'm playing on the field with dudes that got scholarships at Division One schools. So I'm going to show you, you ain't better than me. Like, I'm mm. like, I'm like, I, I, like, I, I need all that. I need mm. all that. Like you supposed to be D one. I played next to Chris Brathway. Chris Brathway was a monster defensive tackle who had a scholarship to Virginia. I'm talking like in high school, he was two seventy with a six pack. It was stupid. Mm. It was stupid. Like he was one of them dudes. Like when I seen when I was doing like HSPD in the summertime in the frat, like the, the measuring stick. Like he was like one of those measuring sticks where he was like, all right, if I could get him. Yeah, like I, yeah, I, I, I'm yeah. on, a, I'm on a certain kind of level. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> did you ever get the six pack? <laughs> oh, me? Nah, 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 nah. Now nah, I wasn't talking about getting a six pack. I was talking about, I was talking, I was talking about get him in a drill or something. You know what I'm saying? I ain't had a six pack since I was like six. Okay, I was like, that just ran away from me. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Look, from good. a lot of us, me too, bro. Believe that. <laughs> Yeah. But but yeah, so I you know I I seen all I seen uh, Chris Bradway and, and I and I played next to him and I seen the kind of monster talent he was and honestly man in that game if I didn't win VP he was right behind me 
Mm. So I go in that game. I had what? In a, like I said, I played against guys I didn't know. So basically, and this is funny because guys that were going to Syracuse are already on the field. They were on the team. John Kinder. Shout out my boy, John Kinder. I was just talking to him early this week. Quarterback. He, he played quarterback for Syracuse. He was the quarterback of Long Island. And I sacked him like three times. And I wow. gave him a pinched nerve in his neck. So he used to always tell me, Jay, you gave me a pinched nerve in my neck. And it's like, it's crazy. <laughs> and and uh, Mario Tall, it was a few people that were already going to Syracuse that were on my team, that were on one of those teams. And even Shamarco Thomas, who was a draft pick of the Pittsburgh Steelers, who I played with at Syracuse, he was like, you know what's crazy? He tell me this all the time. He was like, yo, I was, I was watching that game. He said, I watched the game and I looked at, he said, yo, that kid right there, he was like, yo, that kid right there is nice. He was like the next day, he was like the next day, he was like, but they said you was coming here. I was like, oh, that's crazy. Wow. God is good, man. And, and that's how it worked. Like literally yeah. like no scholarship offers at all. And I'm just running on straight desire. And I go <laughs> and I play in that game. I win most valuable player of the game. The next day, Syracuse calls and offers a scholarship. Wow. And full the, ride. Full ride. Wow. Mind you, Syracuse fifty thousand dollars a year. So that's a quarter million dollars. That's a you know yeah. what I'm saying? That's a that's a two hundred thousand dollar deal right there. Mm -hmm. And then same day, Pitt, Penn State calls. Larry Johnson. Remember I was talking about earlier. Yeah, yeah, Larry yeah, Johnson, yeah. You almost best, went to best Penn D State, line yeah. coach in the country. Yeah. So he calls and Rudy is like ecstatic because that's his guy. Like if I was gonna go like if Penn State would have offered me, I would have went to Penn State, hands down. So if so Penn State calls and um so then my coach, one of my, my other my D line coach, they drive me up to Penn State. So back then it wasn't like now where you could like just send a a, a video of the game or whatever the case, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. You had to like burn it on a CD, right? And get it to the yeah, person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I go, I sit in the room with Larry Johnson at Penn State. And he we really can't even watch the film because it's like blurry and like choppy and everything. But he's like, yo, I don't even really need to watch it. I want you to come to Penn State. Like he was like, I, I want you. Like sitting in the office of Larry Johnson, I want you, Jay. Cool. Joe Paterno's the one that holds the keys. Oh, yeah. So I go sit down. I remember this redhead dude. He was like a guy that was helping us walk around. Da, 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 da. So I'm going, sitting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting to hear back what Joe say. Joe say, nah, I don't want to offer him. He got to go to prep school first. So you got to go to prep school or something. You go to like six to seven months, something like that. And then you would go to the school. Yeah. Okay. So Syracuse had, a, <clears throat> Syracuse had the full ride offer. Penn State like, man, go to prep school for seven months. Yeah. Like, my, like my pops would say, a bird in the hand is better than two in the tree. You said it earlier. It's like a gladiator mentality, man. Mm -hmm. So the way, you're, the way you're, you're, you're defining it, it speaks it. Right. Mm -hmm. it, it definitely speaks to what people say. It's a gladiator mentality. Like you want to go in there and rip people's heads off. Mm -hmm. And you know what I'm saying? And but how do you you know, how do you recover from that? Your body like some mm -hmm. of these guys I read. I saw the other day, um, Naeem Hines, mm -hmm. he ran the kickoff. You saw that, right? Mm -hmm. Ran the kickoff 96 yards for a touchdown. Right. They said he reached up to. 21.4 miles per hour. Mm -hmm. So just imagine a guy that's, you know, jacked, 180, 190, mm -hmm. running at you 21 miles an hour, man, and you getting hit by that consistently. Consi How do you guys recover from that, man? <laughs> hey, you sound like R.P. <laughs> my grandma, man. She used yeah. to say, she used to say the same thing to me. She like, Jason, I, I watch a football game. I just don't know how you do it. <laughs> <laughs> How you just hit the ground like that? You just get back up. You yeah, just yeah, pop yeah, back yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's like I said, everything is like the human body is a remarkable thing. Yeah. You can pretty much coach and teach your body to be anything you want it to be, like mentally and physically. You literally build callus. Like, so I know that when I go to training camp that first week or two, my hands and my forearms are going to hurt. But because I'm literally going to have indents in my forearm from people's helmets. But I'm going to callus. Oh. I'm going to callus. And then oh, after the first two weeks, I won't feel it anymore. Your body transforms in a way. Literally yeah. transforms. Like yeah. me grabbing, like me grabbing people with my hands and and grabbing them and throwing them. And yeah. and, and, and the and the amount of pressure it takes when you're taking on a double team and six hundred pounds is coming on your hips and you figuring out how to yeah. how to absorb that contact and then and then redistribute it. So all these things, like, or stop on the dime, like you're moving laterally full speed. 
you stick that foot in the ground, that foot got to stop 300, 600 pounds and go the other yeah. way. So yeah. all these things, your body becomes callous to over time and it strengthens yeah. it. Like you, like, like you can't play this thing. This game is too hard for you not to love it. Yeah. Yeah. That's the beautiful yeah. thing. Like yeah. if you got to love this thing, yeah. this guys that I knew had 20 offers, 30, 40 offers from Georgia and like all these different places. But once they got to the actual field, it was different because yeah. you were practicing so much. You were running so much. You were in pain so much. You had to love it. You had to hate what you were going back to more than you. You know what I'm mm. saying? Like, like even maybe more than you loved being mm. here. Some had to, some had to keep you here, mm. you know, but the people that felt like, you know, it was okay to, to not go. Like I, I know we had fun in college. We drank and we did all that crazy stuff. But like, oh, we was in practice and we was getting after. Oh, you was gonna have to deal with this. Yeah. The guys that couldn't balance that, like couldn't figure that out, like, oh no, like I'm gonna slack off or I'm not gonna nah man. You gotta treat this like like this is everything I got. But everybody that didn't didn't feel that way or don't feel that way. So that's mm-hmm. always gonna separate, you know, the what you call it, the haves from the have not. So the or, you know, the moles from the Joes is gonna be that that mentality of, hey man, like I don't care what's going on. I'm gonna be here and I'm gonna get the job done. And guess what? I'm going to be running 30 yards down the field on a, on a wide receiver play, and I'm a defensive lineman, and that gets you noticed. Now, we get to the good part. Um, well, the whole thing is good, my bad, but the real good part, because this is an amazing part, because, you know, um, i give you an example, my example. I come, you know, same thing, broken home. My father wasn't there. My mother was there. Um, but for me to be a cop now, to have – you know, to be able to have a house and provide for my family, to me, is the biggest blessing in life. Yes. You know what I'm saying? So now, you, out of college, you were the underdog. You dominated the Empire Empire game, MVP. You go to Syracuse. They call you. You go to Syracuse, full ride. Now, it comes time for draft 2014. 2014, what is Jay Bromley doing? Uh, right before the draft. Right before the draft, like, oh, what are you doing oh, in preparation? Really? Yeah, what, like, what, what, like, what, what am I doing physically? Like, and like where what are am you I doing? At? Where you at? Let, let us know what's I'm going the, on. I'm like, in the crib. That you, you were drafted <laughs> the third round. Third round. Third round draft yeah. pick. But tell us, what was you doing? Did you know you were going to get drafted? I knew I was going to get drafted. I didn't know how high I was going to go. Oh, okay. So, so you know, my wife would tell the story a little bit better. Her remembrance is a little bit better. But basically, my agent at the time was probably saying I was going to probably go like fourth round or something like that. So, okay. but my mentality has always been my mentality. So I've never, when I looked at the defensive tackles that were slotted, I didn't think that there were five defensive tackles better than me. So I felt like, all right, you take Aaron Donald. I give you that. And t- you know what I'm saying? I was yeah. like, all right, I'll give you AD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah. but when I looked at everybody else, I was like, nah, man. I had more. I was like, me, Aaron Donald, Nikita Whitlock, only three defensive tackles in the FBS that year that had 10 sacks or more out of all football. Wow. So, so, and you can try to slice it how you want to slice it. I was, I was making things happen. Now, so when I felt like that, I felt like, I wanted to watch every defensive tackle that was drafted because I wanted to look at them. I wanted to learn from them if I could. And I also want to be like, hey, man, I don't think you're better than me. So <laughs> so I, I watched the draft. The first round is one day. Then the second day is the second and third round. So I watched the second round. Me and my uh, girlfriend at the time, which now is my wife, we was watching it. And we watched the second round. Then we decided, all right, cool, whatever. Boom. I'm going to go to the store and get some popcorn. So we go to Tops up there in Syracuse. So while we're in the store in Tops in Syracuse, a, a weird number calls my phone. I didn't know New Jersey like that back then. I'm from New York City. You yeah, know, yeah, New yeah, Jersey. Yeah, yeah. You drive through here. That's it. Yeah, yeah. But you know, I look at the phone and it's his number, and I pick it up, and then uh, and Coach Coughlin is on the phone. Wow. He's like, "Yeah, AJ, we're about to pick you. Uh, they're about to pick you up in the third round. You ready? How much you weigh? You weigh two eighty five? He thought I weighed 285. Like he, he knew it and get off that 285. He was like, 285, we got to put some weight on you. 315, 315. That's all he used to say to me. 315, 315. Mm-hmm. And you got drafted in tops. How did you feel when you got drafted? I was ecstatic, man. I was like, wow. Because at the time, I didn't, I never spoke to the Giants. Wow. So I never even had an inclination. Like if I was Were you go, a Giants fan? Not re- I was and I wasn't because yeah. I wasn't even really a football fan like that. I used to play, but I used to didn't watch something crazy. And then, um, but I watched the Giants Super Bowl. So, because I'm from New York and now yeah. obviously, so if I had to pick one, I'm a Giants fan over a Jets fan. So, but I, but for the Jets, they actually brought me in. They brought me in. I was the only defensive tackle they brought in. 
And I worked out with the coach. Um, this was going into Sheldon Richardson's second year. I was watching film of him, watching. I worked out for the coach. I'm thinking I'm going to be a Jet. Oh, wow. I'm thinking I'm about to go to the Jets, if anything, or or Philly, because Philly came and worked me out at Syracuse, or Indy. Indy came, worked me out one-on-one. So I'm thinking, like, I got a few teams that's, that's looking at me. Boom. So never the Giants. So and then when I and then I felt like I was slighted when I got to the to the combine because I'm like, you go to the combine and combine like it's weird. It's like it's in Indianapolis. It's like a train in the middle. It's like they 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 got a hotel that they turned a train station. They turned into a hotel. So it's like a little like a train in the middle of the hotel that they made rooms out of. Wow. And then like it's just a bunch of different rooms. The combine and stuff. is there every year. Indianapolis, yes. Oh wow. Okay. So you go to the combine and like you, they give you these like uh, these things you wear that has your name and everything with it. And then you can have all these personal meetings and stuff. Right. And then they have. So if you got all these personal meetings, they'll be on the car and then you'll go to these separate teams at different times. I had no personal meetings. Like nobody wanted to talk to me one on one. Like and see how I was doing. I was like, all right, cool. But they had like this like speed dating thing. It was like a big. <laughs> It was like it was like a big room with a bunch of tables with every team That's at the funny table. As hell. Speed so day. you speed dating with all these <laughs> NFL teams. You just sitting down talking to them for hey, the Detroit Lions, da, da, da. and for whatever reason, this was around when Seattle was popping, right? So when Seattle had the Legion of Boom, the bo- right? Yeah. Yeah. Yo, they were so cocky. Like Seattle was so cocky. Like the like the scouts were so cocky. Like they was like, man, you can fill it out if you want to. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Like, like like bro, like like you like you ain't even had no respect, man. I'm out here. I'm you tripping. You know who I am. And it's funny because my wife had bought me and her dad tickets to the Giants game before that, that summer before or that winter before. And so I'm I'm in these you know these these cheap seats. And I'm, <laughs> and she ain't gonna like that. But <laughs> hey, you, you guys were still in college, man. Yeah, she, she did well. Bad. She did well. Yeah, it was me yeah, and her yeah. dad. She she tried. <laughs> and so we watching the game, and then like a year later, I'm the dudes I'm watching the JPPs, the the Mike Pattersons, right? The the Jenkins, you know, the Kiwanukas, right? Like um, uh, Eli Mannings, right? All these people, like now, you know, the William Beatties, like I'm now I'm their teammate. That's sick. How did that feel, man? To be on the field, um, well, first I want to say, man, thank you from the bottom of my heart, bro, because you got me and my family tickets to watch you practice. And it was like a family day. I I don't know. What was it? Like a family day. Eli Apple's mom was there. um, Odell's mom was there. But you got me. So I'll tell you guys about the experience this man gave me and my family, bro. I show up to the stadium. Um, he tells me, yo, we're having like an open practice. Uh, obviously, I'm a diehard Giant fan. So he's like, come to the field, such and such day. But it was brief conversations, which I understand, right? You're busy, you know. So I'm like, damn, is this real? You know, I'm excited. So I get there. I say my name, whatever. And um, they don't know. They're like, oh, we don't see you on the thing. So I'm like, damn, what's going on? So I text him right before he's about to practice. He texts me back. He's like, yo, don't worry, boom. They drive us in a golf cart. From where we were at, me, my wife, my two daughters, to the practice field, and we're in the practice area where the Giants come out. Um, there's food, there's tents, there's like, I'm there with Eli Apple's mom, with a couple of other players' moms, and I was just so blessed to give my kids that experience. We still got pictures of that. You're going to see it, you know, throughout this uh throughout this podcast, this show. But bro, I just want, I never really got to thank you from the bottom of my heart to say thank you for that experience for my kids, you know? Cause I've been, you know, to places and done things, but for them to have that memory and they, you know, and then to, to be able to have pictures of it, it's it's a beautiful thing. So I, I appreciate you uh, giving us that opportunity, man. You know what I'm saying? Oh, uh, no problem, man. I'm glad, I'm glad I could help with that, man. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I think it's, you know, least I can do, man. It's just something so simple to do and and that can create, like you said, those memories and just yeah. you know, be so joyful about something that's, you know, me going to work. Exactly. Yeah, you going to work and I'm over here. So now you are, you out on the field with all these 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 great athletes. Um were you nervous like going into these games? And and I want to get away from the NFL thing because there's so much more to you than that, right? Um were you when you were in those games, when you walked out into the stadium the first time, number 96, and you're coming out into that stadium, people screaming your name. You did it in college, right? 
How did it feel the first time walking out onto a field, people screaming and yelling? How does that feel? Uh, I, I would first say that I don't, I don't really think they'll scream my name like that, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a defensive tackle, and, you know, but, yeah, but nah, yeah. nah, 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 it's all good. <laughs> um, it felt amazing. It was a, it was definitely, it was something that I couldn't really put into words necessarily because like I said, like my thought process was always just try to be the best I can be. I'm one of them guys, like, I really don't believe there's nothing I can do, can't do. Like, I, I don't like if you like, I, oh, he can't do that. Like, why? Like, why can't I do that? Because the, the the difference between me and somebody, like, I can go read, I can go learn, I'm competent, like, there's nothing I can't do. So if God gave me this body and he gave it to me and it's strong, it's athletic, it's quickness, all these different things, I don't care about what you say I can't do. I can get it done in my way. Mm -hmm. So so that was me making this in the NFL. It was like, hey, but, oh, he's not that flexible. He's not this or he's not quick twitch. That's what was going on when I was growing up. Quick twitch, quick twitch. That's all they cared about. I was like, coaches was drooling out the mouth of players that was quick twitch. What does that mean? A quick twitch means that this person like uh, basically quick, like really quick, like really sudden. Yeah. So a player that's really sudden. So Aaron Donald really sudden. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, like the little, little, like quick, quick, quick twitch fibers, right? Even like strength coaches know quick twitch fibers, slow twitch. So, I never thought about it as a quick twitch player. Uh. So, so that was always like a drawback. People would like throw a knack on me, like I'm not a quick twitch player. Yeah. But I never cared because it wasn't, because I've been around all kinds of players. Yeah. And I realized that I've seen quick twitch players that didn't have the mentality, that didn't have the technique, yeah. that you wasted your quickness because you were in a rush to go nowhere. Mm -hmm. While if I'm if I'm smart and I use my hands and I use my eyes and I use my 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 skill sets like I, I'm in a better position to make plays and I'll make more plays than you make. Mm -hmm. So so I'm going to be in better positions while you might make a splash play here and there because of your quote unquote quickness. I'm going to have an overall better game because I'm going to be consistent. in the right position. I'm going to be consistent. consistent. I'm going to use my hands. You're going to let people hold you the whole game. You know what I'm saying? Because you don't use your hands. So is that true? Does a holding play go on every play? Is there a holding every play? Yeah, but it's 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 holding. Holding is is really a call when it's excessive, right? I got you. Okay. When it's excessive, when you're trying, when you're when you get out the frame of an individual, like the the body frame of an individual, when you're trying to make a play, and this still latched on, that's holding. But as far as like, if an offensive lineman, if I let them grab me in my chest plate and just because they they're taught to grab and squeeze, so if they grab me. And you squeeze me, and I don't get your hands off me. I'm, I don't even call that holding. Like I call that, hey, bro, you better man up, bro. You need to figure it out. You become a father somewhere around this. So mm -hmm. your kid is your kid is five years old. My oldest kid is five, five yes, right? Going on six. So two thousand seventeen, you yes. have yeah, going on sixty. Going on six. Six? Oh, I thought you said. I thought you said, wait a minute. I said, what well, is he that that wise? That wise? Is he that wise? So, yo, so nah, so you I remember you telling me you're about to have a baby. Shout to your girl, man. Um, you met her in college? Yeah, my wife, the same yeah. the same woman I'm talking about that was with me when I got drafted and I was in tops. That's my wife. Oh, nice. Congratulations, man. And you had your first, you had you have two sons. Two sons. I have nice. a five-year-old and a three-year-old. God. So you're almost done with your contract with the Giants. How were you feeling in 2017 after having a baby and you having one more year? How are you feeling? How's Jay Bromley feeling at this point in his life? I feel pretty good. I felt like uh, after my, we're coming off a playoff season at that point. That was the infamous boat uh, scandal with the um, Green Bay Packers. Yeah, that yeah, I remember that. The Giants aren't going to relive. The Giants are going to over, they're going to redeem that team. Yes, Shout out, um, <laughs> we're going to be redeemed. Shout out the Giants. Yeah, so I was feeling, I was feeling pretty good. I felt like I, I played, I was playing pretty well. Going into my final year of my contract, I wanted, you know, I wanted to prove something. I wanted to earn some money. Yeah. And I wanted to, you know, just show, show faces, a, you know, just my son. You think like, you don't think like this. Like you think, oh man, I want to show him the world. And I realize that he's like a year, less than a year old. He doesn't remember yeah, anything. Yeah, he don't know. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, it was great just seeing pictures of him with the little earmuffs on at the game and my wife. You know, just being there with him. So it was, That's it was dope, a great man. feeling. That's dope. How does it feel like being a father, man? It's uh it's a interesting thing. Being a father is fantastic because of what I know about my fathers. You know, so I never even with my uncle and I love him, but he was never a, a, a hands on man in my life like yeah, that. Yeah. So 
I'm, the co- the people that have been the most hands-on men in my life have been people that have been like my coaches when I was in high school. And then, you know, my friends as I got older and now the walks and stages of life. Teaching me how to be a man, teaching me Who's your favorite coach? That I've ever that had you've in my ever, life. Who's le- what, which coach left the most impact in you? Now, the, now, you know what's so crazy? You mentioned your coach. You kept mentioning Jimmy DeSantis, your high school coach. Well, I watch Thursday Night Football, you know, when they go, hey, this is uh, such and such. And a lot of guys mention their freaking high school coaches. So I've always said that I think the coaches at the earliest levels are probably the most important, right? How do you feel about that? Yeah, I, to, to that point, I would say it's a tie between Jim DeSantis, my high school coach, overall head coach, and then Coach Rudy, who was my defensive line coach. And I say that because... Coach Rudy passed away when I was about a freshman or sophomore in college. Sorry to hear that, man. And that was like, that was like, if you ever want to see me show emotion, like that was, that was like dad to me. Oof. You know, like, like I remember it like it was yesterday. So I was you took in it my, hard, yeah. I, like I was in my, in my, in my friend's dorm and I got the news and I, and I just started bawling, crying. I had just visited him. We had won the pinstripe roll. I bought him, I brought him one of the balls. He was in the hospital and mind you, like I said, my dad, like when I, like when I, when I say my dad, I'm not talking about my, my pops that was in the penitentiary. I'm talking about the man that was in the home with me. Um, I love him to death, but it was never like that, like kind of relationship. So, but Coach Rudy would pull up in, the, in his Jeep with the doors off and, and pull up and, and come pick me up from Jamaica, Queens and put me in. And this is like an Italian dude, right? He picked me up in his, in his Jeep with the doors off. He the first person brought me to have my own steak took me to have burgers. He took us out as a D-line to have burgers. He bought me cleats. Like, wow. he, he was a father figure in my life. So, when he passed away, that was really difficult. And then Coach D, he's always been a remarkable man in my life. To So, like, literally, so the crazy thing about high school is, I, if it wasn't for Coach D, I wouldn't be here because I was a dumb knucklehead, right? So, two things I did that left me, I, could, I wouldn't have been here in high school. So Coach D had a rule that if you don't go to camp, you can't play on the team. So if you don't go to preseason camp, you can't play on the team that year. So I oversleep. You know what I'm saying? The day that morning they're going to get on the bus to go to camp. So Damn. I oversleep. I'm thinking like, dang, bro, I missed it. And they're going to like Mount Vernon or something, right? So the couple hour drive, whatever, from Queens. And so Coach Rudy tells Coach Blissett, who was another D-line coach, shout out Coach Blissett, he tells Coach Blissett, stay back, wait for Jay. So he waits for me, and I drive in the car with him up to camp. So thank you, Coach, coach D, for that. But then also what happened was in high school, we were working on the summer as, as a team at a field, right, every afternoon. I was working at the YMCA. I thought the YMCA had better equipment. I didn't want to be outside in the hot heat working out. I was like, okay, I'm going to lie and say I'm working – and not go to the workouts. Only go like once or twice a week when I'm when they're doing something I like. Yeah, yeah. And then I do that. Coach D finds out through a, through another teammate of ours, a Jamaican guy, and he's not even doing it on purpose. He's just he's just thinking he don't know that it's a secret. You know what I'm saying? He just don't know it's a secret. Like yeah, yes, I work out with yes, I yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, I'm strong boy, yeah, <laughs> yeah. He, and Coach D like when you work out with him, yeah, we work out every day after gym. He kicked us off the team for like a day, but he was like, you know what? I, I want to kick you off like, like all, like forever, but I'm not going to make an emotional decision. So he's like, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a wait. He's like, I'm not going to make an emotional decision. So from that, we went to camp, had to be up every day at 5 a.m. <sighs> every day when the dew is on the grass, I'm on the grass. I'm, I'm a huge advocate for time. I believe that that's how you spell love. You said it yourself. You know, you could be in the same house as me and you could tell me you love me, but if you ain't showing me, if you ain't coming to pick me up, if you ain't spending time with me, then how am I supposed to believe that you really care for me? So that's why I'm so big with my daughters, spending time with them. Sometimes, man, I ain't going front. My little one, she wants to play every day with her toys. And the other day I'm sitting down here and she's like, daddy, can we come play? She comes in the office. 
and I'm tired. Like, not tired, tired, you know, but like, I'm like, ah, oh, because for some reason, when it's time to play with the kids with the toys, something comes over me. I get tired. So, bro, I get tired, but then I think to myself, bro, I thought to myself this, and I said, yo, one day she won't be looking for me like that. One day she'll be so she'll be into her friends and I'll be looking for her. And I said, I need to make the best of these moments with them. You know, an opportunity that something I thought of is, hey man, like I've always been a player that had to learn technique. I had to yeah. learn the fundamentals. I had to learn the things that were gonna yeah. bridge the gap between me and the person that was more talented. Yeah. So because I had to learn, right? And I, I learned from some great coaches, Coach Jenkins out in Florida. Some great coaches, Coach Jimmy Brumbaugh. Shout out Jimmy Brumbaugh, who's one of the best defensive line coaches I had. Ryan Nielsen at the Saints, one of the best coaches I had that, that really coached and really stood on technique. And it bridged the gaps between talent. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It, it, it makes up for that gap when somebody's just faster, quicker, stronger. You can, yeah. you can still win the battle. So I created Bromley Football Academy as an opportunity to help people evolve with that. So, no. so like, man, you might be talented, but even if you are talented, how much better could you be if you implemented these skill sets? If you implemented, yeah. if, you know, the reason we read books is because we're trying to, we're trying to, like you said, time, we're trying to jump over time. Mm. Yes. So you read books because you want to fast forward this thing. I don't want to have to live through 30 years of experience in order to learn what you learned. If you put 30 years of experience in this book, let me jump over those hurdles that you already went over. Yes. So I can, I can yes. not have to go through that. Like like um, <laughs> like like a, a great uh, a great um, quote, great quote, uh, you know, Hove went through that. So you wouldn't have to go through that. You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, Hope yeah, did yeah, that. Yeah. So you wouldn't have to go through that. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, Great yeah. philosopher right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so he do so got some bars, man. He says some crazy <laughs> things. And, so I try so to yeah. I try to look, I try to look at things like that when it comes to Bromley Football Academy and how I can help people in that way. That's dope. And because my coach used to, one thing used to always be was like, it's only one person can do the drill at a time. But everybody doesn't have to wait to do to have their turn to learn. Mm. So if there's two people ahead of me and one person doing a drill, I can be visualizing, I can be going through the process of what the drill is going to be like. So by the time that I get there, I should know what to do. If, if you are next in a drill and the coach has to tell you what to do, that's a bad sign. Mm -hmm. That means you're not paying attention. But why are you not paying attention? What are you here for? Everybody doesn't take coaching the same way. The beautiful thing I, I really do appreciate football was, and, and even the coaching, my experience I went through, I learned how to take criticism. That's and good, people, man. people, people run from criticism because criticism sounds like a bad word. Like it sounds like a rough stab, you turn the knife kind of word, right? Yeah. But when you've grown up in it, especially like man, when you come from the hood, bro, like when you come from poverty, you come from these things. Like a lot of things don't like things just bounce off. Yeah. Like it's like, bro, yeah. it's like I, I, I know, I heard I, worse. I, yeah, know? like I know, yeah. I know what you said, but I know what you meant. Mm. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't, it wasn't all about the tone of it. I know what you meant by what you said. So I ate that because I tried to, I want to get what you, what you was putting in it because your emotions in that moment might've been raw and it might've came out the wrong way. Now we can work on that. That's cool. There's always something to grow with, but what did you mean? Like the coaches, like coaches, you'd be like, Hey man, I'm not attacking you the person I'm attacking the act because a coach's job is to get you to do what you don't want to do. I just read in a book, you have to be willing to do the things that you're uncomfortable with to be great. I'm now in this stage of my life, I'm actually in product development, right? I'm what they call an agile coach, scrum master in product development. And what you learn is, is that businesses want to try to, you know, create as much certainty as possible, right? They want to create as much certainty, know, how, know what they're going to do, when they're going to do it, how the numbers are going to come, where the customer's coming from, where the money's coming from, all these different things. But like another great philosopher said, you could plan a pretty picnic, but you can't predict the weather. So the, literally the, the best thing that's in front, the, the, the closest thing you're going to have to what you say you want to do is probably the closest thing within arm's reach. Meaning that the forecast is only good for the, net, for the day because the weather changes tomorrow. Absolutely. So how do, you, how do you go about, how do you build your life in a certain way where you really, you, you're adaptive to whatever environment life puts at you. You plan to do X, Y, and Z, but what happens when you lose a loved one and that throws you off? Mm. What happens when you, your, your, your spouse loses their job and that throws off the money that you thought you were saving putting away? You're getting into a... Bro, you're getting deep because you're getting into the emotional intelligence thing. 
Emotional intelligence is is more key in life than being book smart or having mm-hmm. a high IQ. Did you know that? I, I didn't know that. You are emotionally intelligent because to to where you made it and you're very intelligent, smart, book smart. I could tell just by the way you carry yourself. But what I want to say is I read a book about emotional intelligence. Some of it. I didn't read the whole thing. I'll be lying if I said I read the whole thing. But they said that people that are emotionally intelligent, that know how to adjust and maneuver, right? And know how to, oh, okay, this happened to me. This is how I'm going to adjust. My emotions are not going to overtake my thought process. And it also coincides with how you deal with people. Now, you talking about coaches that coached you and they have to know how to coach and how to coach specific people in a specific manner. That's emotional intelligence because the way I coach or the way I talk to Jay Bromley can't be the same way I talk to Danny Rivera because they might receive it differently. 100%. You feel what I'm saying? No, so that's, yeah. I love what you're saying, bro. You, you got to, you know, and you learn this in the NFL too. The NFL, you're going to learn this really fast. Everybody's not the same. So in the in, in in the NFL, you learn it at that macro level, but because we live in a society that tries to paint everybody, we're going for equality, right? Which equality means we should all have the ability, the ability to do the same things, right? If we meet the criteria for whatever that thing is, you know what I'm saying? But the reality of it is, everybody. The truth is, nobody's even born the same. A ten pound baby and a five pound baby are not the same. But once they, they, but it doesn't mean that the five pound baby can't grow to be a bigger man or woman than the other kid. That's a fact. But even if they were the same size and they were identical twins, they're still not the same. Yeah. All right. They 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 have different thought patterns. They have different um. They have different likes, dislikes. They have different intellectual thought patterns. All these different things. The reality of it is, we're not the same, and we're not equal. You know what I'm saying? That that's the interesting thing. We're not equal. Like everybody at a company is not equal. Some people are more profitable, right? But it doesn't mean that whatever whatever piece of the pie that piece of the puzzle that you play is important. That pinky toe is vital. You made it to the freaking National Football League, bro. Coming from Southside Jamaica, Queens, bro, with a broken home and like adopted. Like, you know what I'm saying? So when people say I'm a victim or you know like I love what you're saying that we're not all equal cuz you're not equal to the brother that's on the street corner. No. You are much greater than that. You know what I'm saying? So I yeah, appreciate that. I think because people get it misunderstood because they they go directly to a, a thought pattern of you're better than me. That's always going to be the, the comeback to that. You think you're better than me? Nah. How about the fact that once we go to school, tests have grades. And when they give the grades back, if I have a 100 and you have a 90, I'm better. <laughs> it, it proved it. I didn't, it, like, it's just what it is. It doesn't yeah. mean that under God's eye, like I'm more valuable than you in that way. Yes. You have value yeah. to give to the world. Look, you have to realize when somebody's better than you at something, like Aaron Donald is, is one of the best defensive linemen ever, man. if not the best defensive tackle ever. He was better than me in college. He's better than me in the pros, like period. And I hope to see him do well in, in, as long as he decides to do it. But that's the reality people have to come to. Like you, you can't just, you have to be able to acknowledge that, have that humility, but understand like, hey, if I want to aspire to be like you or even surpass you, it's going to take an amount of sacrifice that at this point I was unwilling. Like to get better, it just takes sacrifice. When I think about what made me better than my contemporaries when it came to in college of guys that had more talent than I did, it was what, what I was willing to sacrifice and what they weren't. They weren't willing to sacrifice going home after after practice. There's an old saying, brother. Um, talent, wait, um, hard work beats talent. beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, and and it, it, but it, it doesn't always mean, hey, I'm, I'm pushing more weight than you or I'm doing X, Y, and Z. Like, I remember after practice, I hated watching film. To this day, I don't like to, I never feel like I've done enough. I'm doing good enough. Like, I hate watching film. Even now, like, now I'm in a different world. I, like, I hate, like, kind of trying to figure out how good I'm doing or not, right? Because when I watch the film, I don't think about, if I had five, six tackles and I had three sacks, that's six or seven plays. I played 70 snaps. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. I hate watching the other ones. I'm just, ah, I cringe. I'm just in the back of the room. I'm like, and they're like, Jay, that was, I'm like, nah, that was, I, I'm better than that. Yeah, you know, you're so, hard on yourself. I think I think to be really good 
at anything you have to be. You have to be your worst critic. Like I had to be my worst critic. I had like, when I was in college, I watched film before everybody. I watched film before the coach watched it. Once I finished practice, I got my shower. I'm up in the film room. Everybody want to go home, run. I'll do my homework at 12 o'clock at night if I got to. I'm going to watch this film and I'm going to cringe because I already remember in my head every play I already did wrong. I remember every loss in my head. So I'm going back to fix it. So by the time my coach tell me, you ain't even got to coach me. I already coached myself. You know what I'm saying? Because I know what to do. But that was my mentality. So so when it now when it comes to now life in general, that's still my mentality. It's like, it's never good enough. It's never like it's it's always something to be tweaked. Like I'm like the compliments are, I don't take them like that because it's like ah, I know it's, I could have did better. It's good and it's bad, bro. I'm keeping a buck with you. It's good to be like that, to have self competitiveness and be like I could do better. I could do, but you also have to be able to, you know, you have to celebrate your victories. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah, I made it here. I did that. Like bro, like. Three sacks, seven tackles as a defensive tackle in an NFL football game with the greatest athletes on earth in the world is phenomenal, dog. The other 70 plays, yeah, I get it. You were 70, but nobody, Michael Jordan didn't make every shot. I'm pretty sure Michael Jordan said, damn, I could have shot that a little better, but you got to celebrate your victories. And yeah, you do got to look at your flaws, I believe in that. You got to look in the mirror and say, yo, what can I fix? What can I do better? Me, as a law enforcement officer, now the beauty is we have body camera, right? I could look at what I said. Maybe I could have said something a little differently. Maybe I could have approached the car a little better tactfully. Maybe I could have done something differently. So same thing. I'm watching my film. But I also like to say, man, I'm glad I did that the way I did that. Because it, 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 just, it just motivates me more that I'm doing something right. And, and it's okay to celebrate your victories, but it's not okay to get complacent in them. You still want to get better. You know what I'm saying? You went from the Giants 2018. You went to the New Orleans Saints. Um, you were down in New Orleans Saints. You got to play with Drew Brees, right? Yeah. How was that guy in the locker room? He was a phenomenal guy, man. He was definitely, Eli's great, but the, <laughs> Drew Brees is Drew Brees, and he was the best probably overall like player as far as that Hall of Fame first ballot. Other than like Cam Jordan is up there, Jason Pierre Paul, um certain people like that that I've had the fortune to play with. But um he was a phenomenal teammate, but also just a phenomenal competitor is how he prepared. I watched him go into an empty indoor facility and literally like visualize the game and then just walk himself through it. Then if he threw a pass in practice, he wouldn't just throw the pass and like go back to the huddle. He would throw that pass and then he would survey the field to see what else was open, mm. knowing that eventually they might pick up on that. So I got to figure out what else to do. Wow. So he was cerebral in that aspect. Even even in the latter part of his career. Oh, 100. He could have kept playing. Yeah, he, he just probably, he yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah, wow. That, that's, that's insane. So now you went... You went to the Saints. You had the fortune of of you know playing with some great players over there as well. Um, one thing I want to jump back to real quick: Odell Beckham. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so I was at the practice. I, I seen Odell a couple times. You know, I was I wasn't a big fan of Odell, man. Um, I keep it a buck, man. Um, I just I think he was a great a phenomenal athlete. Uh, but I just didn't think that that time, at that time, when I was at that practice watching you guys, seeing them dance and act goofy and just like, I didn't feel like he respected the game and I just felt like, I just didn't like it. Um, I know you, you know, you're friends with him probably and you've been around him and you know him um, without getting into too much. You know, how did the people feel about him? How did the teammates feel about him back then? Because I think he's changed now. I think he's he's more mature now. What do you think? I'm um, sure. I know he's a he's a new father. So shout out to that yeah. and being a new father and, and just getting older. Thirty now, I believe. We both yeah. thirty years old. Odell was he was beloved in the locker room because he was he was who he was, and yeah. he was he he cared about his teammates. He had fun with the game. Some people might have called it you know lack of respect for the game, but like he's a premier talent. Like literally, there's probably. I don't know too many. He only position he can't play is defensive, offensive line. You know that's the only position he can't yeah. play. And then again, so if you blitz yeah. him, blitz him every time, he might give you three, four sacks a year. <laughs> if you just put him on the edge and blitz him. You know, so yeah. 
So he was just one of them kind of guys, and he just he just he never wanted to for them to suck the fun out of the game for him. That's I, that's my vantage point of like, man, he didn't because it's easy for the game to do that yeah. because when so much money's on the line, when 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 heck when coaches get fired for one bad season, you got to imagine the emotions going on in that building. Like we don't like what people don't understand is you're working for I wouldn't even you're working for a Fortune thirty two company. Forget Fortune five hundred. You're working for a Fortune 32 company. So there's only one. You work for one of 32 teams. Yeah. These teams are multi-million dollar, billion dollar corporations. Mm-hmm. You are the product. Right? So I remember when he did the catch. I remember when he made that catch. That was amazing. But you don't understand the, you know, if Odell, if they gave him a hundred million dollar deal off that catch, they made $500 million off that catch. Oh, of course. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. you got to understand the way he, when he made that catch, it flooded with everything about that catch. The next day they had stuff made about that catch getting sent to him and having to sign. Like he benefited, don't get me wrong to this day, but like, I, like I said, he, he embodied man of just not wanting them to take the fun out of it. Even though we didn't really have as much success in New York as we would have liked to. So I'm glad you clarified that for me because from the outside looking in as a fan, you don't see that. See, obviously, you have the inside look. So that's why it's so important to get a perspective, a different one. Because like I said, from the outside looking in, I'm like, man, this guy's a cancer to the team. That's the interesting thing, right? Because cancer's inside, right? That's true, yeah. Y- yeah. You looking at it from the outside. That's true. That's you know? true. So, that's so true. when it came back to people talking to the actual people that were around him and with him, it was like, bro, like, they love OB, him. OBJ, like man, he gonna go to practice. He gonna he gonna run routes. He gonna return kicks. He gonna yeah, yeah. he gonna kick field goals. Like he wow, yeah, he gonna yeah, do yeah, whatever yeah. you ask him to do to help the team. That's dope. And then he gonna do it with a smile on his face. And then he's still gonna get on the sideline. We are gonna crack jokes. We are gonna laugh. And, and we are gonna enjoy life. Like it's never no like him tearing anybody down and nothing. Like yeah. yeah, if he don't get the ball, yeah, he's a wide receiver. Maybe a little prima donna. So what? All your best ones were. Yeah. So yeah, what? Yeah, like yeah. you, who are you comparing him to? Yeah, who that's who true. are you trying? That's to make true. him to be you yeah. knew who Jerry Rice was you knew who Randy Moss was you knew yeah. these people you know what I'm saying yeah. you knew what they were like so don't, don't pay him you know yeah but I don't think I don't think Jerry Rice was that flamboyant maybe not that flamboyant but he's one he is one but he's, he's the goat Warren. he's the goat uh, Jerry Rice is yeah, the goat yeah. you can't say he's not the goat who would be the wide receiver goat man to you the wide receiver go. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, we took a, we on the wide receiver topic, but yo, nobody beats Jerry Rice. I, I go with Moss. He, what? I go with Moss. I know. Why I know. You I, say know Moss? The, I know. I know. The numbers might speak different. Yeah, the but, numbers are definitely. But Randy Moss was was different. I mean, Randy Moss. Yeah, but then you could. You know what I'm gonna say? I'm gonna say Megatron was better than Randy Moss. I, I and I think yeah, he just had a shorter career. I think Megatron was an animal because yeah. they would put that big dude in the slot outside. Like, bro, he was all around. See, Randy Moss could only line up on the outside. Yeah, I and get run, that. And run, you know, vertical verticals. Routes. And, you know and they, I mean? they played they played punk coverage versus Megatron. You know what I'm saying? They put yeah. their punk coverage on Megatron. He was he he he. I, I don't think they've done it to a receiver since Megatron put animal, punk coverage bro. on somebody. Yeah, yeah. But he he was definitely uh once in, I don't even know once once in a hundred years kind of time. And he only played what seven years? Like seven eight years. Like, could you imagine was, if he would have played 10, 12 years? <sighs> Come on, man. Exactly. Yeah, he would. You know yeah, he would definitely be number one. Yeah, period. Yeah. So that's that's my that's my take on that. So um, thank you for your perspective on OBJ, man. I was actually rooting for him to come back to the Giants because I thought he had matured. And like I said, look, as a fan, looking out, I thought he would have been a great asset. Oh, yeah, we can definitely use him. Yeah, Yeah, but but the the problem problem is, this is the thing, bro. And now that we're on this topic, ah, God forgive me. I'm I'm, Listen, I'm a Giants fan, but I'm a realist. And I'll tell you how I feel. I don't think Danny Dimes is the guy. You were getting into the topic, bro. Yo, so we don't got to talk. You don't got to say nothing. Don't say nothing. Don't say nothing. But this is my this is my position as a fan. I think he's a great athlete. God forgive me, please. I'm a diehard Giant fan. I still need to see more. He doesn't have any receivers right now. You act like God is a Giant fan. Like He is. He is. <laughs> he is. He is. I know he is. God up there with a Giant jersey on right now with Danny Downs on. Like, you talk bad about Danny. It's a rap, man. It's a rap. Yeah. You hit a- Yo, I really think God is a Giant fan, bro. 
<laughs> Yo, so I, I'm just saying, I need to see more. Got listen, granted, uh shout to shout to Hodgins. He stepped up. He stepped up big, man. He was on a practice squad. He came from Buffalo. Um Sterling Shepard, great. I, I I love Sterling. I love his his uh his presence. But I just, you know, there's some components that I don't know. I'm still not sold on them. Uh, you know, I think we should franchise tag him and move forward from that later on. We should see what happens next year. But he did produce pretty well this year. Uh, then the D.C. defenders pick you up in the draft, 2022, XFL. What happened with that? I, I read something that the league just got abolished or something. Well, that was because, it, honestly, that was because of COVID. If it wasn't for oh, COVID... Man. COVID really, literally, the, what happened with that was we were doing great. We were, I was playing for DC Defenders. I was, I was doing well over there. And we had just beat the number one team in our division. So we were the number one team in our division. And it was great too, man. These fans really came out in DC, man. They filled that, I believe it was Audi Stadium or something like that. The fans were phenomenal. The, the people were phenomenal. The stadium was phenomenal, man. We had a really good football team. We were building something special to win it all. And what happened was literally like, so COVID happened. It was COVID. It was like, it was like a slow process. Like nobody understood what was going on. Yeah. We watching the TV. We don't hear nothing. We win the game. We go to practice. And like the next day we just get a call and they're like, yeah, man, we're going to have to send everybody home, you know? Wow. So it was like, and I was living, you know, three, three and a half hours away in New Jersey. So, you know, you pack your car, you, you go home. But so it was, it was a good thing. Um, I think that if COVID didn't happen, the XFL would be, what going on three years now or so, mm -hmm. and the amount of money and that people will be able to generate, which I think it will happen again over time because of people's love for football, people's yeah. people's almost need for football. That, mm -hmm. and then it's not competing with the NFL as far as time, space, and all that good stuff. So, I, and the athletes and, and certain things. Obviously, the quarterback position is very hard to fill because there's not a lot of good quarterbacks in the world. Um, so, but other than that, man, it was a phenomenal time. Nice. Do you miss football? I love football, man. I, obviously, I've contemplated wanting to pl go play in the XFL. Like, hey, man, like, let me go hit somebody. Like I said. You think you still got it? Oh, if I put the time in, I, I, I think I definitely could do it. But the only thing about it is I ain't going to lie. Football take a toll, man. Yeah. It take, especially like when I, you play D-line, it takes a toll. You, but can I tell you what I see in you? You still, you still want it, bro. Oh, no. Nah, For not, some reason, I, I get I wanna, that vibe from I wanna you. I want to choke somebody. <laughs> I want to, <laughs> hey man, I tell, ain't nothing like, ain't, you, ain't nothing like punch, punch, look, cause I'm a, like, now I'm a civilian, you know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I'm a 300, like, I don't realize how big I am until like I'm on camera you or something. You, you know what I'm saying? Animal, I feel like yeah, I, I got like a, I got like a Napoleon complex or something. I yeah, think I'm yeah. smaller than what I am. Nah, you you huge, know, I be, bro. I be, I be, I be playing with my wife. She'd be like, you forget how big you really is, man. <laughs> and, yeah. and I'm just like, because ain't nothing like punches, but I look, it sound bad, but it's like, you know, like punching somebody in the chest, like like feeling the breath come out of them and like snatching them to the floor to go make a tackle, sticking their foot in the ground or getting a quarterback lined up. Right now, you really can't hit them. Like, yeah. like you used to can hit them, you know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah. Used to, used to can like, used to like, I want to see what the number two feel like. I want to hit them and, and run through them, you know what I'm saying? Lay yeah, on them yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now they don't want you to lay on them no more. Back crazy, in the day, yeah. they used to be like, now nah, put that weight on them. Let them know you coming back, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Let them know you're going to yeah, be back yeah. here like, yeah, feel all 300 pounds on your shoulders. Yo, what? Now that you say that, what the hell goes on under those piles, man? They be, yo, they be pinching each other, spitting on each other. What goes on under there, man? It's a dirty game, man. It's a dirty <laughs> game. It's, it's a dirty game. I done heard a lot of stories, seen a lot of things. Yeah, yeah. Ideally, you want to stay away from piles, like yeah, legit. Yeah, yeah, like if yeah. you if you could avoid a pile, you don't want to be in a pile. Yeah, yeah, yeah But yeah. hey, man, like they look, put it like this, like it. it They'll do anything to get that ball. I could block okay. a little bit. Okay. I could block oh, a little block. bit. I thought you said you was going to have hands or no, something. No, I got I got hands, bro. But you got hey, hands, like, I got hands, yeah. There. I know how to do the diamond and all okay. that. Right? Hey, that's how you okay. do it, right? You throwing up the rock. Yeah, okay. the rock. <laughs> but okay. is that, that's you how you catch the ball, right? Like okay. that. Like, Look, right? Yeah, whenever you say that's how you catch the ball, you probably don't catch that many balls. Right? <laughs> yeah. Pause, pause, yeah, you're right, yeah, pause, you're yeah, wrong, pause, yeah, yeah, pause, yeah, yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I guess, I, yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I didn't, yeah, I didn't catch that, baby, you know what I mean? but yo, I, I played tight end for them, and bro, my chest, I come home one day, my wife's like, yo, your chest is all bruised up, is that normal, like, getting hit in the chest for blocking and all that? Oh, I, I, I ain't gonna lie, I thought, you, I thought you were saying, get hit in the chest from balls, and I was like, <laughs> 
Pause, was bro. Like, yo. Pause, man. My man hey, wilding, bro. Hey, hey, hey yo. yo. I was up, like, man? hey, man, that's not how you catch. <laughs> like, <laughs> Oh, he's a chess catcher. He's okay. a- <laughs> catches that's how he chest. catches. He catches with his chest. He's, he's that's phenomenal. Number, you're not it. supposed to catch with your chest. I, that's what I thought. But I thought you were a different oh, breed. Man. I didn't know. I didn't know. Thought you we figured actually, out a new technique. We added in all that out, bro. You know that we. That's no, good. That gotta, gotta, gotta stay. That gotta stay. That gotta stay right there. They gotta. They gotta know what you good gotta, at. I catch the balls with my chest. <laughs> But yo, listen, I'm I'm very grateful for you, man. I'm great. I'm very grateful for you being so humble and so modest and coming here today to the Bookham Show, sharing your story. You know what I'm saying? I think your story is so important. Is there anything else you want to tell the people before you know we wrap this up? Is there anything special you want to send? Any shameless plugs you want to put out there? <laughs> Hey, shameless plug, uh, the Tyree Catch Camp, man, coming to you in, uh, at, at the Super Bowl, February 12th. Shout out David Tyree, man, throwing it, throwing a camp for the kids and doing everything like that. Right back in Arizona where the catch happened. You don't know, you might find some bubble gum on a helmet somewhere with a, with a football. You never know, you might play some type of some type of Easter egg hunt or something like that for the catch camp. So shout out to David and Tyree. Be out check, there? check out his joint. Uh, I may be out there. I'm trying to get up out there. You know what I'm saying? They they, they trying to they trying to hit your boy for an arm and a leg to get to Arizona in the Super Bowl nowadays. Jesus you know, so Christ! I, I yeah. like I like my legs, so <laughs> so I'm trying to keep my legs. But yeah, man. Uh, other than that, man, I'm just grateful to be here. I think uh, back to what you said. Our, you know, my life. I'm grateful for the life that I've lived because uh, I'm grateful for the hardship, man. I and, like. I don't think I would have wanted it any other way because I'm like. I'm preconditioned for this. Yeah. Like I'm preconditioned for whatever it, for what for whatever's next. You know what I'm saying? Like my wife, like, you know, she my wife is a phenomenal woman. Shout out my wife, Alexis. She's a beautiful woman. And that's that's my love. She takes care of me and my take care of my family. She's a doctor as well. She's a phenomenal woman. That's 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 my ride or die right Shout there. Shout out to Miss Bromley, man. And um, you know, but like I'm conditioned for this because I don't see it any other way. Like I, like I literally, I'm grateful. Like, so when I think about my, my upbringing, I think about my aunt, my uncle, my sisters, man, like they toughened me up over the years, my cousins and how God is, you know, predestined me to, to, to be in this lane. Like I, I really think my life is marked with the favor of God Amen. and that no matter what I touch, if I decide that I'm going to put the time into it, it's going to be successful. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and everybody doesn't have like confidence, but one thing I learned about football was the moment you lose confidence, the moment you don't believe you can do it, stop doing it. Wow. Because because the because the con I remember it was going into my last year with the Giants. And um and we was in spring camp and all that stuff. And I was killing it, starting for the Giants. And I remember walking into the room and then uh, Coach Graham, he was like, he was like, Man, there's something different about you. He was like, Everybody know it's something different about you. Like you walking around here different, like like nobody can talk to you. And it was because I was literally just telling myself every day, like nobody here can talk to me, like no, like meaning like in a respectful way, like you, like I'm here, I've seen what the NFL is like, I belong here, and I and I'm here to make plays. Mm. And and I and, and the the irony of it all is that if you watch my football career, even when I got to the 49ers, I only got better. Like if you watch the film, I only got better. But sometimes it's not in the cards. But I also realized that God is so good. Amen. Because sometimes he'll not allow you to be successful in a certain area because his purpose for you is bigger than that. And sometimes you can be digging your own grave with your success in mm. a particular area. Like if I be if I'm if I continue to go, you know, be, you know, a football player and make all this money, maybe I don't realize how important, you know, your faith is. I don't realize how important my wife and my children are. I don't realize how important relationships are and how mm. those things cultivate and keep you. So Sometimes we don't understand how some things are a lot more important than money. Money will be made. Money is a matter of putting the time into the right things. Absolutely. You know? So yeah. I'm grateful for that. So if that ain't thing, anybody touch anybody, it's more about sometimes God will permit you to not continue in a place where you are actually excellent because his purpose is better. Wow. That's, that's, that's an amazing message, man. <laughs> that's an amazing message because I, I could relate to it because I know I'm a good cop. I keep it, listen, man, I know I am. Not only as as the way I treat people in my community, but the way I carry myself, the knowledge of the job, 
But there's been times that doors have closed where I wanted a position and I felt like I deserved it. You know, at one time I wanted to be a SWAT, you know, on the SWAT team and I passed everything. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I passed the physical, I passed the shooting range, I passed the practicals and then they shot me down. And I was like, yo, what? I trained for this. Like how could, but God had a different plan for me. So I think that's a wonderful message. And we didn't really talk about our faith, man. And and your faith and the church that you go to. The church I go to isn't a big church at all. It's a small church. Um, yeah. Really just mainly probably no more than like 40, 50 people, something like that. I love those um, churches though, man. can find, yeah. man, intimate, you know, with yeah, the people. Yeah. So you get to know the people there. The most important thing is God, what he left us here for. You know, mm. somebody said it like this. God loved you, loves you, so he saved you. He loves other people. That's why you're still here. Because mm. if it was all about you and he was so he was so impressed with you as this, this sparkling thing, he would just took you. Mm. But what we read in the <clears throat> word of God is God always uses men. Men are the conduits to his will getting done on earth. Amen. Amen. So, so the opportunity that we have when we, when we decide to get saved and when we do get saved is that we have an opportunity to be that conduit for change for people that we love and we care. I we love that about. word conduit. I use it all the time. Absolutely, man. And, 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 and it's funny you say that because, like I said, I use conduit all the time. And I believe people like you are the epitome of God's purpose. What I mean by that is that God uses the most imperfect people with the craziest backgrounds to accomplish greater things in this world. Like you going through everything you went through and what God saved you from and where you're at now and that you edify God in all that you do. Because you mention God all the time in all that you do. So I believe that he uses guys like us that went through trauma to help other people. You know, somebody asked me one time, yo, why you want to be a cop? Why do you want to be a... I said, it's weird. I never understood why, but I always felt the need to help somebody or do something for somebody. But then clarity was brought to me through something I read and it said, people that go through trauma normally want to help people get out of that same trauma. You know God, God uses people like people yeah. like us because he removes excuse. Mm. Because people always go back and say, well, I was raised like this or this happened to me. That's why I don't believe. He's like, nah, man, I'm going to take away all your excuses. Jesus was born in a manger. He was poor. He was like, what's the excuse? Mm -hmm. Everybody, God doesn't white out the sins of the people that he uses. But when he talks about them after they're gone, he he, bl he blots out their sins. He talks about them as if they were perfect. Mm. Deep, man. Deep, man. We got to wrap it up, bro. <clears throat> um, We're going to wrap it up, man. I thank you once again for your time, brother. Um, Jay Bromley, check him out. Uh, follow him. Uh, is there anything for the Bromley Football Academy that you want to put out there? A website that they could register, or uh, anybody that wants to do anything with Bromley Football Academy, you can follow me at Tape Ninety Six on Instagram, and you can connect to me there, DM me, or anything like that for any sessions or anything coming up. Um, follow me there for anything related to podcasts. Maybe back here on the Bookham Show. Anything else I got coming up. So I'm just grateful for anyone that's ever followed my story, anyone that's ever really, you know, prayed for me, believed in me, thought about me in a positive way. I'm grateful, and I hope you're blessed. Amen, man. Episode number nine, Jay Bromley, tape 96 on Instagram, the Bromley Football Academy. Stay blessed, stay positive. We out. Peace. Let's do it.